we're going to talk about uh, about a little bit about ovulation. Um, I will share now my screen to uh, show you my presentation. Okay. Is it correct? Can you can you see it correctly? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. We are good to go. Okay, fantastic. So let's start with the, this presentation of today about timing ovulation and intercourse and giving some tips when couples are trying to conceive. First thing is to, be, to do a little bit of introduction uh, to fertility. And uh, first thing that I always explain to the patients is about the ovarian reserve and age. Uh, we all know that ovarian reserve um, decreases with age and actually women are born with a certain uh, ovarian reserve that decreases progressively, but also uh, not just uh, a decrease in, in the terms of numbers, but we will also have a decrease in uh, terms of quality of the eggs. Okay. And uh, Dr. Gatton is going to uh, explain it later, but just a little bit, uh, little, little thing about ovarian reserve test which is that what can we see about the ovarian reserve test? We have different blood tests like the antimulierin hormone that is produced by pre and small antral follicles and uh, the higher the better. And on the other hand, we have also the basal hormone levels of FSH and, and estradiol. Actually, FSH is the important one. And actually, FSH is like, uh, is the, it stands for follicle stimulating uh, hormone. And it's like the fuel of the ovaries, I always say. So if the ovaries need more fuel, it means that probably they're not working correctly. So uh, the less FSH levels we have, the better, okay? Within a range, of course. And on the other hand, we have the ultrasound in which we can do the, the antral follicle count. And actually here in the picture that I have put, you can see an ovary with different uh, follicles uh, that we can see. And that's what we normally count to have an idea of the uh, general uh, ovarian reserve that patients have. But in terms of quality, there's no test to see the quality of the eggs. So actually that's why we're always uh, talking about age, okay? Apart from that, about genital tract, about the ovaries and uterus, just general things. Um, what do we need to have a, a conception, a natural conception? So we need that the ovaries function correctly. We need uh, an ovulation and, a, and an oocyte that you can he see here in the picture. And we need that the tubes uh, function also correctly because this tube will um, take this, this oocyte and in the tube, this oocyte will be fertilized with the sperm, by the sperm, okay? And then uh, the embryo will develop, will be dividing uh, in this tube until it arrives at the endometrial and the uterine cavity. And we will have like a blastocyst, as you can see in the other picture on the right. And this one is going to implant uh, inside the uterine cavity on the endometrium. And how is our cycle controlled? Because a lot of people tell me, okay, how is my body, is my body a clock or, or how does it work? So actually when we have regular cycles, um, we know when everything is controlled uh, by this uh, menstrual, by this axis that is called hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. And this is the one responsible for having uh, regular or irregular menses, okay? And actually, how does it work? This is in the central nervous system. And uh, we have these different parts, as you can see in the diagram, in this graphic. We have the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary gland, and then, of course, uh, the endarvic ovaries. And uh, this will respond uh, in response of some signals that the central nervous system will send to the hypothalamus. So how does it work? The hypothalamus is going to produce GNRA, it stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. And these are going to be pulses uh, that will vary in frequency and amplitude. And this GNRH is going to uh, stimulate the anterior pituitary gland to create the FSH uh, hormone that, as I have uh, told you, is the follicle uh, stimulating hormone and the LH, which is the luteinizing hormone, that both are the gonadotropins, okay? And this FSH and LH are going to stimulate the ovaries and the ovaries will, will produce a, a follicle that is, will grow, will produce estrogens, progesterone and other kind of hormones. And all this is going to have a 
uh, feedback effect on the other uh, previous phases. And this is kind of a circle that uh, controls itself, okay? And different things like stress, silent weight loss, excessive exercise, and other things can have an impact on that and can have uh, uh, can give some signals to the hypothalamus and can create some problems in the menses. So a little bit more about genital tract, about the ovaries and uterus, what happens exactly in a cycle. So I will divide it in the follicular development, which is the uh, development that happens in the ovary and in the endometrial development, okay? So actually, uh, we can see that in a natural cycle, we have different follicles available to grow, as we have uh, seen on the first uh, picture that I, that I have uh, shown you of the ultrasound. And all this could grow in response to hormones, but in a natural cycle, we just have FSH and hormones, general hormones, that will stimulate one follicle, okay? So we will have one follicle that will be the dominant follicle, and that's why we normally have babies one at a time, because we ovulate one egg of one follicle. Actually, what happens is that we have an FSH that will increase a little bit, and this one is going to stimulate the follicles, and there will, will decrease a little bit again, and this will make that just the, the follicle that is more important will be the one that will grow and we will have just hormones to, to grow this follicle, which is the dominant follicle. And the dominant follicle is going to create uh, estrogens, okay? When these estrogens are created, these ones are going to uh, stimulate the endometrium, which is the other phase, okay? So after the menstruation, which is here, we will have uh, the, the proliferative uh, phase, sorry, that means that the endometrium lining is going to grow in response to the estrogens. And what happens is going, these estrogens are going to increase a lot and are going to produce a LH peak as well. And this is going to produce the ovulation. Uh -huh. And after the ovulation, uh, we will have like a scar in, uh, in our ovary that is called the corpus luteum and that will produce progesterone you can see here, and this progesterone, sorry, and this progesterone uh, will be increasing and is the one responsible for changing the endometrium to the secretory phase. And this is the endometrium that can receive um, an embryo and that can let the embryo implant. If we have a pregnancy, these hormone levels will uh, stay or increase. If we don't have a pregnancy, these ones are going to fall down and we will have again our menstruation. Here I have put some uh, pictures of, uh, of the ultrasounds of the ovary. In the first one we can see like the antral follicle count, so uh, follicles that are small. Second one, we can see that one of the follicles is a little bit bigger, so it's growing. And in the third one, uh, we can see a pre uh, follicle uh, that has 20 millimeters in this, in this case. And here we can see different ultrasounds. Um, the first one, we have the thin lining of the initial phase. Uh, then in the second picture, we can see this like three laminar uh, lining, like three lines, which is the three laminar, which is the pre ovulatory endometrium lining. And in the third one, we can see uh, this hyperequagenic endometrium that is the one that we have during the secretory phase. And with this uh, picture, we can see that we have progesterone influence in this. Uh, doctor, uh, sorry, I would like to yes. intervene. Can you do the screen share again as it's not visible now? And many people it's are saying visible that it's not now? visible. Yeah. Hold on. Eh? Uh, let's do it again. Up, up, up. We start again here now. Yes, doctor, now it's visible. Yes. Please. Have you seen the this one, the, the one of before or not? That is fine, doctor. You can continue from here. Yeah. Okay. So here I was explaining this these pictures of the, the ultrasound in which at the first one we have the initial phase of the endometrium lining. Okay. On the second one, we have this three laminar um, endometrium lining. Uh, that is actually a pre ovulatory like three lines that we can see. And the third one, we can see this endometrium that is a little bit more white, more hyperechogenic, that has the influence of the progesterone, which is the secretory phase. 
So let's go on then. Now about ovulation and fertility, some little things. Um, we can find some signs of ovulation in our patients. So actually what we know is that vaginal discharge uh, is going to change a little bit before ovulation due to the estrogen influence and will be clear and stretchy. And other things that patients can feel is uh, a little bit of pelvic discomfort, uh, some emotional changes in some patients, increased libido, okay? And then regarding uh, the test that we can uh, see, in which we can see if we're ovulating or not, we have the LH and estrogen peak in which we could test in blood or urine. And we can also do serial ultrasounds mm, to check if we are ovulating or not. And after the ovulation, we know that also body temperature is going to increase. The corpus luteum will produce uh, progesterone and this progesterone is going to influence the hypothalamus, and then we will have an increase of the, of the body temperature. So it's something that we can also see. And also the progesterone levels in the mid-luteal phase, so more or less one week after ovulation, uh, will show us uh, if we have had an ovulation or not. And about ovulation and fertility. So um, ideally, uh, we should have sexual intercourse as close to ovulation as possible to have the, the maximum outcomes. But for sure, knowing exactly when you're ovulating is, is not easy. Mm -hmm. So some tips uh, that you, you should know. Some cycles from 21 to 35 days are usually ovulatory. And what you should know is that ovulation takes place approximately 14 days before uh, the period. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's good to look at some different cycles before and see uh, what's the length of these cycles and calculate approximately when you're going to ovulate, approximately, okay? Then on one hand, we can also, uh, it's important also to know that the egg has the possibility of being fertilized for about 12, 24 hours, but that the sperm can survive between two and five days in the female genital tract. So therefore, it's why we recommend uh, to start intercourse at least four or five days before the moment in which we calculate that we will ovulate approximately so that the spermatozoid is waiting for, for the egg, okay? And then on the other hand, um, there are the LH tests that uh, women can do at home that are based on the detection normally of the LH surge in urine. They must be done from four or five days before the middle of the cycle or before the day that we think that we ovulate, okay? So that's why it's important to chart us some previous months. And ideally we should do this test in urine uh, every 12 hours mm, to avoid missing shorter peaks and that we don't see it. And of course, it's not as accurate as other things, but it's what we can do at home. Uh, but it has a false negative that could be related with uh, short peaks and also false positive that could be related with PCOS patients, um, with uh, premature ovarian failure, with menopause. So to try to avoid these false positives, it's better to use tests that are, um, are going to detect the LH levels, but also the estrogen levels. And when starting to conceive, some general tips, uh, carry out a life as healthy as possible for sure, uh, have a variety diet, fresh food and processed food, uh, avoid saturated grants, um, fat, sorry, avoid toxics and sanitary lifestyle. And if you have any medical conditions, for sure, we tell you to talk with your doctor and tell your doctor, your treating doctor, that you want to become pregnant to see if the medication that you're taking is correct or not, or should be changed. Regarding to lifestyle, there are many things that have been published here. You can see this. Uh, and in, in, in these images, you can see that obesity, underweight, smoking, alcohol, caffeine, and other drugs, uh, and toxins and solvents of chemical products, all these could have an impact on uh, infertility. And explain a little bit more about all these things. What should we avoid? So actually, uh, we know that smoke um, has an impact on fertility. It can, uh, in women, it can produce gonadal dysfunction, problems with follicular development. And we know that women that smoke um, have lower ovarian reserve or, or could have uh, earlier menopause. We know that it can have an impact on the tubal function, which, which is very important, right? Because as I told you, it's where the oocyte will go and where the oocyte will be fertilized. 
And we know that uh, in assisted reproductive techniques, it can uh, be related with less oocytes, less quality embryos. And in men, it can uh, produce oxidative stress and, and lower pro progressive motility. Uh, and actually, uh, DNA fragmentation of the spermatozoids that would lead to embryonic blockage, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's important to avoid smoking. Mm -hmm. Try to reduce it as maximum as possible if it's not possible to stop it. Uh, okay. Uh, about alcohol, alcohol can, can have an impact on the central nervous system. So in very, very high doses, it can have a, an impact on uh, the regularization of the cycles and all these things. It can have an impact on the quality of the oocytes. And actually also in men, it could be related with increased DNA fragmentation, miscarriages, okay? It is uh, an effect that is dose dependent, of course. Uh, and actually, um, what we tell our patients is try to avoid alcohol or drink uh, three, four units maximum per week, if not. And regarding to caffeine, uh, we would say avoid excessive intake uh, because it could have an impact with DNA fragmentation in sperm, with miscarriages, blockage of embryos. So actually, we tell our patients to drink one or two coffees with caffeine a day, not more than that. And regarding to marijuana, cocaine, all these drugs and other drugs, uh, of course, we have to avoid them. They can negatively impact gonadal function and also they can produce other problems. For example, in marijuana and men, it can have an impact on motility and morphology. In women, it can cause ectopic pregnancies, so pregnancies outside the uterine cavity, miscarriages, uh, uh, less embryos to transfer in ART techniques. Cocaine can have a big, big impact on miscarriages and abruptive placenta, which can cause a urgency section. And other things like androgen steroids that can be taken when people are going to the gym and want to have a very high muscle mass. Uh, if they take androgen supplements, androgen steroids actually, um, it could have an impact, a big impact in, uh, in the production of sperm. They, it can lead to azospermia, which means lack of sperm. And, uh, but it's normally something that is reversal mm, when we stop this kind of, of things, medications. And... So now talking about lifestyle, diet and weight. So about diet, as I told you, uh, we recommend to eat varied, have a calibrated diet, um, um, eat uh, complex carbohydrates, avoid sugars, mono, uh, eat monosaturated fats, omega fatty acids, fresh vegetables and fruits. Uh, it's important the folic acid and avoid processed foods uh, and, and things like that. What it, it is also important in vegan people, for example, they can have a, a lack of uh, B12 vitamins. So this should be uh, taken in consideration and they should uh, have a, a supplement. Normally it's included in, the, in, in all the food of, of vegan people, in some foods of vegan people, but not always, okay? And about folic acid, it's very, very important. Uh, so that's why I put it here apart. It has a very important impact on the closure of the neural tube that occurs early during uh, pregnancy. So it's very important to have good levels of it uh, when, we, when we start to, to conceive. So that's why we normally uh, recommend to start a preconception multivitamin or a folic acid supplement before starting. And just to know uh, where we can find folic acid as well for our normal diet in green leafy vegetables, citrus fruits, legumes, liver, sea, uh, seafood, bluefish. But it's more in vegetables than, uh, than uh, foods of animal origin. And it's better to, to eat it steam or crude than cook or freeze because it can decrease a little bit uh, the levels of folic acid. And regarding to the weight, uh, we would look like a BMI between 19 and 25. What we know actually is that in patients with very low BMIs, we can have an ovulation problems. And in obese patients, uh, more than 30, we could have irregular periods, increased risk of insulin resistance, miscarriage rates, and complications during pregnancy and during delivery also. So what we recommend is try to at least uh, for sure under BMI is under 35 and if it's possible to decrease it under 30. And regarding to exercise and stress, well, what I told you is that uh, um, you should avoid uh, sedentary life. So um, you should do moderate and not strenuous uh, exercise. So not too much, okay. 
but good daily. Um, it can help regulate menstruation, especially in overweight or obese patients with PCOS, and can help reduce insulin resistance. Uh, of course, too much can create irregular cycles or amenorrhea. And uh, men should avoid cycling more than five hours per week, more with uh, when it's done in the mountains and with a lot of impact on the scrotal zone. Mm -hmm. Also, something that I always tell is to try to avoid high temperatures like sauna, which is not actually exercise, but it comes sometimes after exercise. And uh, it's very uh, important physically, but also emotionally. It can help us to manage stress related with when we do assisted reproductive techniques. And stress has not a clear evidence in, in ART, um, um, but we know that uh, patients, for example, that are doing uh, assisted reproductive techniques, that a lot of them uh, have, have a lot of emotional involvement uh, and could have a lot of stress because they, they need to go to, through a lot of steps. So sometimes we, we tell them to, to get help from a coach, from a psychologist to try to manage it better. So in conclusion, uh, I would say have a healthy lifestyle in terms of our uh, food and a little bit of exercise as well. And um, it's important knowing your cycle and trying from five days before the probable ovulation and the day of ovulation, every other day or every day. Um, be aware of natural signs that you could feel when you ovulate. And also another thing is that using some abs or LH tests has not shown uh, better outcomes related to um, just having repeated intercourse during the days of the fertile window. So thank you very much and good luck to everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Anna. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Anna. Thank you for your elegant lecture. I will now begin my talk and at the end of another 15, 20 minutes, we will take the questions together. Thank you. So this is essentially, we do three webinars a month, two for patients, one for doctors. And this is a patient webinar. And essentially it has to be in layman's language, very simple. And uh, I will try to break down this subject about investigations for an infertile couple into a very simple, into a very simple uh, language and a very simple presentation. So after one year of unprotected intercourse, a couple today must take medical help. And to understand the investigations, this is a short video that will tell us how natural reproduction takes place. So this video is just one minute, 59 seconds actually. It tells us from release of egg from the surface of ovary in the mid-cycle, the egg is picked up by the end of the fallopian tube. It is travels up to the mid portion of the fallopian tube and lies waiting for the sperm. Then you have a video that we placed a microchip camera at the top of the male urethra, so you can actually have see the male ejaculating and the ejaculate with the sperms hitting the posterior phonics of vagina, the sperms making its way from the vagina to the cervical crypts. And then over the next 72 hours, the sperms go up to the internal tubal ostium and enter the fallopian tube where the egg lies waiting for them. And hopefully one sperm fertilizes the egg. And after fertilization it takes four or five days for the fertilized embryo to travel back to the uterus implant. If all goes well, at the end of nine months, you have a baby. And this video essentially tells you this whole story in 59 seconds. Watch this carefully.
So this is what happens in normal reproduction. And if there is a problem in this process and you don't get pregnant, then within one year of unprotected intercourse today, it is recommended that you contact your gynecologist or fertility specialist. Infertility today is a common problem. One in five couples the world over need some help getting pregnant. It's always important and very urgent for the patient. However, most doctors take a wait and watch approach. They keep telling the couple, go back, try for three months, six months, and then come back. Often patients get fed up, frustrated, and keep changing doctors. This is a shame. These are common mistakes that are done by the medical fraternity and these should not be done. The couple is not seen together. Usually the husband is busy in office and many a times it's the wife who comes for a few visits and the husband's semen analysis is not performed along with the tests right in the beginning. Sometimes after two months, three months, the husband finds time to do the semen analysis. And then you find out that there are no sperms or less sperms. Investigations are performed in a piecemeal fashion rather than as part of an overall strategy. They are often done in a slow, time-consuming manner and patients really get fed up. So what is good medical practice or GMP? The couple must be seen together and treated as a unit. First, diagnose the cause of infertility and then start the treatment. The workup, what we are going to talk today, the testing protocol must be explained to the patient and must be completed maximum in 60 days, ideally in the first month itself. To understand what you need to test is, you have seen the video, you need only four things to make a baby. Simplified, you need eggs, you need sperms, you need the uterus to carry the pregnancy, and you need patent healthy tubes where fertilization takes place where the egg meets the sperm. So very simply, when you talk of investigation, you just need to test for these four things, the eggs, sperms, uterus and tubes. Let us talk in simple language about how we tend to investigate these. And also these investigations should not be very expensive. Not everybody lives in affluent countries and this is a cost sensitive area. So you have to find the balance between what are the essential tests and what are what is a luxury in investigations. So what is a cost effective testing strategy? The most important, a simple semen analysis. Remember, it's an easy test to do, but very easy to do badly if the lab technician is not trained. Then you need to do something called baseline blood tests. By baseline, we mean these tests are done ideally on days one, two, or three of the menses. And the single most invest important blood investigation is AMH anti mullerian hormone, you also do FSH, LH, TSH, prolactin. If you are given a choice that, you know, the patient cannot afford to do a lot of tests and do only one test for infertility investigation, I would opt to do a single anti mullerian hormone. anti mullerian hormone tells us the ovarian reserve, how many eggs are remaining. And it also tells us, it can also, we can also plan what sort of treatment or stimulation we can give a couple and plan the treatment. So it holds, it's not only helpful in diagnosis, it is also helpful in planning therapeutics or planning the treatment. FSH, if you know less than 15, the patient is going to be producing her own eggs. If it is more than 15, the patient is getting into premature ovarian failure. LH to FSH, if there's a reversal of ratio, usually FSH to LH is two is to one. If the LH is more than FSH, you're looking like at a polycystic ovarian syndrome. One in five patients attending a fertility OPD have some thyroid problem. Most of them are hypothyroid and the TSH is high. And this is a master gland. So you need to ideally, when you do infertility treatment, we check not only for TSH, we also check for antithyroid antibodies. And again, one in five patients today have some form of autoimmune disorder out of the thyroid patients. And it's and they will go on probably on thyroxine replacement. Hyperprolactinemia is also common and needs to be treated. If thyroid 
and prolactin are abnormal, please treat the thyroid and usually the prolactin comes back to normal. So this second group of tests is essentially to tell us if the eggs are healthy and the eggs are being produced every month and what is the quantity of eggs remaining in the uh, female partner's body. And HSG is a hysterosalpingogram. It's a over a hundred year old investigation, but it's still the gold standard. And it's done on day eight, nine or 10 of the menses. You can't do it during the menses. It's an objective documentation of the integrity of the uterine cavity and the integrity of the fallopian tubes. Follicular studies, doctor has talked about, you do it beginning from day one, two of the cycle, track the growth of the follicle till the follicle ruptures and then seven days after the follicle ruptures to find out if the endometrial stripe is changing to a secretory phase. If you suspect anything or ultrasound or HSG, then you do a video laprohistoscopy today. And when you talk about the male partner, the semen analysis, there are a lot of tests, but essentially what you need to do is basically a semen analysis and a comprehensive genetic culture where you just send the same sample that is given for analysis. Part of it is given for culture and antibiotic sensitivity to find out if there are any bacteria or urea plasma and this can be treated. Sometimes motility problems or non-liquefaction or viscosity problems are simply because of long-standing semen infections. And these can be picked up on your routine semen analysis and comprehensive genetic culture. Semen analysis includes investigation of the number, morphology, motility, survival of the spermatozoa and volume, as well as physical and biochemical characteristics of semen. The sample seen on your screen is a wonderful sample with most of the sperms actively forward, progressively motile, and it will be considered a very good sample. And so it's basically the lab technicians that do the testing and today, 15 million per ml and more than 50% forward progressive motility is considered normal by WHO standards. A female partner again has a string of tests, but I have told you essentially you need to find out if the tube is okay and the eggs are okay and the uterus is all right. So out of all these tests, we will tell you what we think is really important. So again, repeating FSH, LH, TSH with antithyroid antibodies, the prolactin, anti mullerian hormone. Today, vitamin D has found its way into the list of essential investigations. This is not a luxury. Vitamin D levels should be above 30 and vitamin B levels affect implantation and the endometrium at a sub-molecular level. And it's very simple, vitamin D supplements can be taken to increase the level to above 30. There is something called antral follicle count when you do these tests on first, second day, you also do a transvaginal ultrasound of the uterus and ovaries. Antral follicle count is the seeing how many antral follicles are detected in each ovary at one time. So first you put in a vaginal probe, turn it to one ovary, count the number of small follicles less than five to six millimeters in size. And that is the antral follicle count for that ovary. And antral follicle count is directly proportional to antimullerian hormone. If the antral follicle count is very low, the AMH is going to be very low and the woman is having a poor ovarian reserve and will be a poor responder. On the other hand, if the antral follicle count is very high, you are looking at a hyper responder in all probability to a polycystic ovarian syndrome patient. And in such patients, along with this baseline profile, it is mandatory to do a simple 12 hour fasting insulin. So this is how an antral follicle count is done. You get an ipsilateral ovary into the center of the field. These are the small antral follicles, less than five to six millimeters in size. You count all the follicles that you can see in one plane. Once you freeze the frame, then do not keep moving. So the maximum number of small follicles, less than five, six millimeter in size that you can see in one plane is the antral follicle down here. The antral follicle count is 13 or 14. 
And so you're looking at a hyper responder and this is a typical PCO like ovary. I've told you HSG is still the gold standard. So when you do an HSG, you get surprised, especially in developing countries. So this is a retort shaped tube, most probably beaded retort shaped tube. This is tuberculosis diagnosed on HSG. This is another big retort shaped flask shaped tubes here typical of tubal infection, most probably tuberculosis. So it's very important you do the simple test before you give, start any sort of treatment. You must insist that first, according to principles of medicine, first is the diagnosis and then is the treatment. So these are the basic diagnosis. You've done the basic baseline profile blood test. You've done the HSG. And if there is say a proximal tubal obstruction, one side is open, one side is closed. You can still go ahead and do whatever intervention you want, an IUI or an ovulation induction. But if there is a bilateral tubal block, ideally, you should not do any intervention. The patient should be taken for a laparoscopy to confirm your diagnosis on HSG. A few years back, there was a, a fad of doing sonosalpingography using air and saline, again, to find out tubal patency. And in my own unit, we had absolutely done Absolutely clearly. So you can see once you push the, the air and saline, if the tubes are open, you see the waterfall it sign. It does resemble a waterfall on transvaginal sonography in a patient with the sign seen as clearly on both sides as is shown in the film. It is. And if the reflux mm has -hmm. seen and clearly if in the you have a reflux, the then you have a bilateral tubal block. The faster you inject air and saline, the, the faster, faster is the reflux. In, in the, the faster it goes back, then it is definitely a case of bilaterally. And lastly, you can be used to do this in the medical college. Do a negative contrast hydrogynecography using saline fill up the pelvis with saline. This is very small group of patients who have undergone multiple laparoscopic surgeries and before they are taken up for another surgery, you want to quantify the adhesions inside the pelvis and you fill up the pelvis and create an artificial ascites. This is the female end of the fallopian tube and these are adhesions of the pelvic wall. This is, these are a series of clippings where all different types of adhesions are seen clearly. Essentially, you mark, you see. And then if you find any abnormality on the HSG or you suspect anything on transvaginal ultrasound, then laparoscopy is a must. And once you, uh, this is the same patient where the HSG showed the retort shape, big tube. And here you have a typical retort shape, plus shape tube and suggestive of tuberculosis. Ideally, such patients. They must take the complete anti-tuberculosis treatment. Ideally, get the tubes detached on laparoscopy itself, and then their only treatment is IVF or in vitro fertilization. At the same time, you can do a hysteroscopy, which is the visualization of the inside of the cavity to see the integrity of the cavity. So what is a good medical practice keeping a balance between acceptable benefits in gain? The single most important thing is detailed history taking. Please spend 10, 15, 20 minutes asking the history. Sometimes the patient gives you a very good history and you can find out and plan what are the investigations that need to be done just based on her symptoms. I have again stressed the importance of baseline hormonal tests and serology. And you know, just those tests are essential. They are not a luxury, they are a necessity. Assessment of tubal patency is a necessity and not a luxury before you give even a single tablet of clomiphene. Assessment of ovulation similarly is a necessity and not a luxury. Semen analysis and culture can be done with the same ejaculated sample um, uh, collected in a clean sterile jar. And if any of the above need further testing, then specific tests can be done.